welcome again to the highlights of our Sunday service this week. We gathered together on Zoom and also in our church building. And we started by stopping to give thanks to God for his goodness to us. His goodness to us as individuals and his goodness to us as a people. So let me encourage you to do the same, to stop and just say thank you to God for his goodness. Whether it's been in a hard week or a good week, God has been good and we can stop and thank him for it. We're going to hear a couple of worship tracks and then Gavin preaching. The first one invites the Holy Spirit just to come amongst us wherever you are and make his presence known. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your
also in our service this morning for people we know who just need God to touch their lives. We prayed for our church, we prayed for our community, we prayed for our world, Zimbabwe where they desperately need God to send rain, America where they're heading into the elections. We asked God to intervene in all sorts of situations near and far. So perhaps you would want to do that as well before we listen to Gavin preach. God hears and answers our prayers. Nehemiah chapter 4, and reading from verse 1. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? 
Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was with his at his side, said, what are they building? If even a fox climbed on it, it would he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your face, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see it, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows and armour. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other and each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Whatever you hear, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there, our God will fight for us. So we continued to work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. And Nehemiah saw an amazing man because he has our vision to rebuild the walls. And remember we talked about how Nehemiah's uh, one since his priority was birthed in prayer. And then he, he went before a foreign king, the men are King Artaxerxes, and said, I want to go and uh, rebuild uh, the walls. And the hand of the Lord was upon Nehemiah and then through King Artaxerxes, God granted him his request. But I remember last time in Nehemiah chapter 3, uh, Peter read that long list of names. Well, we were told that these were people who made a difference, people who brought their gifts, their talents, to go about that act of rebuilding. And I talked about it all in this series about how together we will achieve more for the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is meant to be built by a body, not just individuals. And actually, it's really important that we release, we resource you into your full potential. But one thing that I do know is this, when God's people make a conscious choice to step forward, to, to go about the act of rebuilding the wall, one thing I do know is this, that virtually our enemy, he reacts. 
We have a, a devil who's crawling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. We will face opposition if we want to go about rebuilding. If you want to step out in faith, don't expect it to be plain sailing. You will face ridicule. You will face scorn. You will face shame. There is always a cost in discipleship. For Nehemiah, when he went about the act of rebuilding, Sambala heard about it that he was rebuilding the wall, and he was greatly angry. He was enraged. He feared uh, the Jews. He tried to, in one sense, find their security. I remember when I began to step out. I said, God, I'll begin to preach. And I got an opportunity to preach in this church four consecutive Sundays. This is not a word of a lie. This happened to me four weeks in a row. I walked into this church and literally a Big Mac meal and a milkshake was thrown over my head four weeks in a row. From four different people, the youngest was 12, the oldest was probably in their middle 80s. It was bizarre. Why would someone do that? Especially to a young lad who's going to preach in a church. But then I think when I look back now, it was actually as I was stepping out, I really believe that the enemy was trying to rattle my confidence. So I actually, you know, Gav, who do you think you are? And sometimes that's what happens when we face ridicule. And that's what we see in Samurai and Tobiah. The people of God face real ridicule to hinder them from fulfilling their mission. John chapter 10, verse 10 is a verse that we all quote often. That I have come that you may have life in all its fullness. And if you know me, I'm shouting at that point. I'm going, can you quote the whole verse? The whole verse says this in John chapter 10, that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life in all its fullness. If you want to have life in all its fullness, which we would all say amen to, I hope, can I say to you, remember, you will have an adversary who wants to steal, who wants to kill, and who wants to destroy. See, what had happened previously before Nehemiah was that Asia went about that task of rebuilding. He faced opposition and then he withdrew. He stopped that act of rebuilding. So this is a point that Israel has been in its history before. But now Nehemiah has got that commission. What will he do when he faces ridicule, when he faces opposition? See, I think if you've been a Christian long enough, we've all seen this. We've seen people who have started a great work for God, but they are saying when the heat is put on them, they've stopped. You know what the saddest thing is, though? The saddest thing is sometimes not when we face discouragement from outside, but it's when we face discouragement from inside the camp. And I say to you, remember, Sambala and Tobiah were not people where they were from foreign nations. They were from the nation of Israel. And I say to you, these were people who knew their godly heritage, yet still would refuse to go about that act of rebuilding. And I say to you, friends, we need to be a community that I encourage one another to continue to rebuild the wall in our day, in our generation. We need to be a people who continue, who persevere. James chapter 1 says this, that perseverance must finish its course so that we may be complete, lacking nothing. So can I say to you, friends, when we face discouragement, when we face hard times along the way, it's really important that we never give up. You know, we all, we do all want to experience the blessing of God and we all hold up our hands and we say, Amen, bring it on! But do we want the cost? Often, not all of the time. But can I say to you, what I found in ministry is that the church which is going on is often loved by its community and hated by its community sometimes in equal measure. 
That doesn't mean that we don't want to be good to our sense of community. Far from it. And this community has been good to us and has blessed us with a lot of favor. But can I say to you, don't excite it. If we want to see God fully rebuild the wall, we will face opposition. We will. Remember, Jesus said, in this world, you will face trial, but what? Take heart. I have overcome the world. Well, when Samuel and Tobiah came, and when they gave that opposition, when they cheered God's people, how did they respond? They continued to rebuild the wall. Maybe for some of you this week, you felt like it's been a really discouraging week where you face opposition, maybe you face ridicule, and God said to you, never give up. Never give up. Remember, the task ahead of you is still is never as great as the power behind you. Even when you face ridicule, remember, the task ahead of you is as never as great as the power behind you. See, Sandra and Tobiah, they didn't just start off by themselves. We read of how they caused more troublemakers to come on the scene. The Ammonites, the Ashdites, the Arabs. And they all became very angry. And they plotted confusion amongst God's people. Can I say to you, sometimes that's what happens. Can I say to you, not just is there people who pray that God will bless the work, but there is people out there in our community who will pray against the work of God. And, and that's, that may sound scary to some of you, but that's absolutely true. There is people who will pray against the work of the kingdom of God. I remember where I used to live in Edinburgh. And this is known in the community, so this isn't breaking any confidence at all. There was this knock on the door one day, and one person said to me, I'm praying for your church. And I said, that's wonderful. And do you know what she said after that? She says, I'm praying every day that it's burned down by fire. Now that was interesting, that woke you up. And then she said one thing else. And she said, I pray for this every day and I want to see what that is. Can I tell you, her prayers have been answered by our adversary. Can I say to you, there is people who will pray against the work of the kingdom. But that is why it's so important as God's people that we stand up to pray. Actually, Jesus says actually sometimes the kingdom of God has to be taken by violence. And by that, he's not talking about military might. But actually, we are in a spiritual warfare where actually, as God's people, we have got to pray our the so we pray to our God for a guard of protection over the work of the ministry here. And we need to pray that over us as a church. We need to pray protection over what God has started. Actually, we pray to our God who's almighty. We pray to our God who's all-powerful. We pray to our God who can do all things. We pray to our God for whom nothing is impossible. As I said earlier on, when you read the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was birthed in prayer. But it wasn't just birthed in prayer, that vision to re uh, rebuild the wall, but it was continued to sustain by the people of God's prayer. That actually, God would protect what he starts. Can I say to you, the amazing thing of the Bible is that God protects his children. You know, that actually, God says, actually, he commands his angels to protect you. I wonder if you can remember times in your life when you look back and you can see the hand of God's protection in your life. I want to share with you a story. I don't know if I've ever showed you, showed you the story before. In 2017, the 28th of June, is a day which is etched on my memory. I went to see Claire. Claire was in South Africa. I all started so well. I was flying uh, from Edinburgh to Istanbul, and then from Istanbul on to Cape Town. It was all going so well, and then I was on the plane from Edinburgh, and God spoke to me, and he said, I want you to pray for your safety. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm on an airplane. There's, there's no hint of turbulence. There's nothing. And guess what? I was a good holy guy. I didn't do it. 
And then the second thing the Holy Spirit says, we well, Gavin, I want you to pray. And we didn't get the Holy Guy the second time. Do you know what I did? I didn't do it. And then the third time, I had such a compelling that I had to pray. I did it. I landed on the plane. I landed in Istanbul ship. And then that night, there was a, there was a ball that went off in Istanbul airport. I saw the whole thing. I saw the shootings. I saw everything. It was not a sight I would want to see. But before I went to um, before I went to Cape Town, an elderly gentleman gave me forty pounds, and he said, "You're going to need that." And I said, "This is ridiculous. I don't need forty pounds from this man." And that was the only money I had in my pocket as I went to get on my next flight to go to Cape Town. One problem: the flight was cancelled. I went through the Turkish border, couldn't get my luggage, and there was. Uh, I thought, how on earth am I going to bring that? A, a hotel. A, B, accommodation back to some good hotels the next day. I paid my visa fare, which was £20, so I was now left with £20. Nightmare. Disaster. And then this guy came on and said, you, and he pointed at me, big man, come with me. So he took me to, he took me to the hotel, and then I saw the sign. Hotel, £120. And I thought to myself, I've only got 20 quid. That's all I've got on me. Nothing else. My wallet was in all my suitcase. I had nothing else to get. I said, I'll give you 20 quid, mate. And he took it. Uh, so I thought, I'll give Claire a call to tell her I'm safe. And do you know what happened? My phone charger died. I was devastated because Claire had heard me and all she, she knew I was safe, but that was it. And I said, do you have a phone charger? She said, oh, only one phone charger left tonight uh, in, the, in the rooms today. It was for the exact phone that I needed. Praise God. Again, I could call Claire, I was safe. And she said to me, Dad, how are you going to get to the airport tomorrow? Bear in mind I'm about half an hour away at this point. I said, oh, don't worry, God's looked after me so far. He'll look after me again in the future. I have no doubt about that. And there I was, having my breakfast the next day at half past seven, getting over the events of the night before. And this woman said, you, point right at me. Come with me to the airport right now. So I jumped in this car with this person that I never knew. And I went into the airport. I said, I have no money to help you with the test. Oh, it's no problem. I'll pay us off. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You've been so good to me. And then I went and I turned around and I just simply wanted to say, thank you so much for your act of kindness this morning. And she was far away as I am from Woodrow this now. So if you, aren't, if you aren't in the building, you'll notice about 10 yards. And I turned around to say, thank you. And I'm not kidding you. She had completely disappeared. I went to the airport desk, I tried to check out number 13, I got the last ticket to go to, to Cape Town the next day to see Claire. And then I was in the line after waiting for 23 hours in Istanbul airport. By that point I was a wee bit irritable, a wee bit hungry, but I could cope with that. And this guy stopped me and said, how long did you need to wait at check-in number 13 before you booked your flight? I came at 8 o'clock this morning and I had to wait a good 13 hours in the line. And I looked and I said, what line? There was no line. I just walked right up to the desk. Now you might think I'm mad if you're listening into this. Or do you think it was that the hand of God was protecting me? And I say to you, God puts his hand of protection over his people. And that's what we see in the life of Nehemiah. And that's what we see in the life of you. When you look back on your life, you might say, well, actually, where would I have been if God hadn't stepped in? Where would I have been if God hadn't stepped in in Istanbul? Where would I have been? I don't know. But you know what I do know? God's good. 
Can I say to you, in Nehemiah, when they go about that act of rebuilding, God frustrates the plan of our enemies. Can I say to you, God loves and God does protect you, his children. And can I say to you, it's not just in the big stories, but actually think about God's protection on your life and the small things of life, the decisions which you have made, which could have gone disastrously wrong. But can I say to you, we need to be people that recognize that, yes, we will go through resistance, yes, we'll go through times of opposition, but you know what? More than anything, remember this above all, greater is he that is in you than is in the world. Amen? That's why we go about this act of rebuilding the wall in Stoneley, because we want to see God do great things. And God hasn't given up on us, his people. We will go through times of opposition. But you know what? The one constant is this, that he is utterly faithful. That he's bigger than our enemies. He's bigger than our adversary. He's bigger than the devil. And can I say to you, God is still building his church in Stoneley. God is still building his church in the United Kingdom. And he said that he'll build his church and the gates of hell shall not overcome it. So when our adversaries come, rejoice, friends. Rejoice. Use it as an opportunity to say, remind yourselves of not just how big your trouble is, but remember how great is our God. Our God still sits on the throne. Our God still reigns. Our God still rules. And actually, can I say to you, in this situation of COVID-19, which is unsettling, remember, God is still building his church. That's what gives me confidence. And that's what gives us confidence together. That God's plans, God's purposes have never been thwarted by COVID-19. Never. And they never will. But see, it's interesting. When they went back about the act of rebuilding, can I say to you, the people of God, they worked hard, but they also had their warfare in their hands. They had their swords and their spears in their hands. Can I say to you, we'll go about this act of rebuilding, but can I say to you, remember, there is a spiritual battle, and that is why as Christians, it's so important that you put on your armor, the armor of God, day by day, moment by moment, there is no place, don't take this wrongly, for gospel shooters. People who think, well, actually, you know what? The battle won't offend me. I remember a pastor once saying, I overheard the conversation. And one person said, Pastor, it's wonderful. I don't get the same spiritual opposition anymore. And the pastor started to cry. He said, I'm so sad about that. Can I say to you, when we go through the opposition, remember your battle gear, remember your battle warfare, but remember the battle belongs ultimately to God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And then after that, put on the full armor of God. See, the people of God, they cried out to God and they put on their armor day and night. And none of them took off their clothes. None of them. Can I say to you, friends, and I think this is a word for us, our church. I'm going to stress that. We want to see God be built. We want to see God transform. We want to see God's glory come. We will face opposition. However, this is what I want to leave you with. And this is the encouragement above all. Remember, you're no longer a slave to fear because you are a child of God. Because God hasn't given us a spirit of fear but, or timidity, but a spirit of love and power and of a sound mind. Can I say to your friends, we need to be people who step out in this day, who step out in our generation, say, God, in the midst of exile, in the midst of disorientation, which Nehemiah has written into the people of God as a community, said, we're all in. No matter the cost, we're all in. Can I say to you, is it time for us to say, Jesus, 
we are going to be all in, no matter the cost. Jesus, after he says, you know, if you want to follow me after all, it's a call to take up your cross daily to follow him. But actually, when you do that, when you take up your cross, the reward will be 30, 60, 100 times as much. Why does, why does Jesus say that? Actually, because he says, actually, the greatest joy in life, the greatest blessing in life will be knowing Jesus. Can I say to you, friends, 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 I'm getting excited. When we rebuild together, Remember, there'll be a cost, but there'll be a great God is with us. The God who began a good work in us will carry on to completion. I'm so glad that God's not finished with this church yet. But one thing I know, and this is what I want to encourage us with, as I come into land, accept the Lord, build the house. We as his laborers labor in vain. This is a journey. Nehemiah began that journey in prayer. He had courage. He had been a base foreign kings. He mobilized God's people. He faced opposition. But he knew that the task ahead of him was as never as great as the power behind them. And you know what? The same is true for us. The task ahead of you is as never as great as the power behind you. So let's uh, sing if you're at home or if you want to sing in the building, you can't afraid to no longer sing. You unravel me with a melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are the cold